What's going on guys, Alex Leba back here again for another spoiler review. Uh, I shouldn't say another spoiler review, I think this is actually my very first spoiler review I've ever done on this channel. It is for Jigsaw, and I'm joined today by my buddy Mark from Real to Real Productions. Now, I want you guys to definitely go check out this dude's channel, uh, both of his channels down in the description below. Really well thought out, you know, analytical reviews about, you know, movies, anime, definitely go check him out. Uh, oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> What's up, man? Thanks for having me back on the channel again. I know you and I did a kind of a breakdown of the Jigsaw trailer, and it's kind of so surreal to be here doing a spoiler discussion for the movie. I can't believe time moves so fast, man. Now, Mark is a, is a huge Saw fan, and, you know, we were both really highly, massively anticipating this movie, and if you guys are familiar with my channel, and even if you guys have just have, have seen my movie review, this is a film that I definitely had to do a spoiler review for, because I, I have a lot to say about this one, spoiler-wise, and uh, I'm sure Mark does too. There's so much to talk about when it comes to this particular movie, so yeah, I mean, I, I really, I really liked it. <laughs> uh, and, and this is coming from a genuine fan of the franchise. Uh, I, you know, as you said, I've covered this from time to time on my second channel, and it's it's just always been one of the, really, it was the first horror movie franchise that I kind of fell in love with, and to me, the Saw films aren't so much rooted in their torture porn roots, as everyone wants to say, or or uh, their, their gore, or any of that other stuff. To me, the Saw films, unlike Freddy, Jason, Meyer, Myers, uh, you know, Michael, uh, Chucky, any of them, it, it it's a exercise in continuity. It's an exercise in timeline and story more so than those films. It might not make sense. It might be convoluted and complex, but with each individual Saw film, at least for me, there is a unique character. Or, or characters, group of characters who go through real emotional arcs, even if they're crazy and somewhat complex, they're still they're still there, and it's still followable, and you still get to get a lot of different emotional uh, impacting moments when it comes to John or Amanda or even Hoffman or other people throughout the series. So. That was something I was looking forward to going into this movie, but I wasn't putting it on myself. I knew that they weren't going to bring in Hoffman or Dr. Gordon or anyone else like that. Uh, but mm -hmm. it was I wanted them to pick it back up and introduce new characters who could who could uh, be interesting moving forward. And and that I think that's like my opening statement here. What do you think of the uh, reveal of a character of Logan Nelson helping John? since, you know, before all of the other films, being the first Jigsaw Apprentice, before Hoffman and Amanda and Gordon. Uh, and also, you know, side question, do you think that Logan was one of the two people in the pig masks at the end of Saw the Final Chapter with Gordon? Hoffman didn't know about Gordon being an apprentice. We're not sure if Amanda knew about it. We know Hoffman didn't know about it. Obviously, Logan's never mentioned by anybody in the other films, but, like... I don't know, like, uh, do you think maybe John kept him a secret? Or do you think maybe that, like, Amanda or somebody, you know, one of the other apprentices, you know, knew about him? And do you think that he was one of the two people in the pig masks at the end of Saw the Final Chapter? Uh, so, like, hard, hard questions. I, first of all, I don't think he was one of the people in the pig mask. I still think, despite the fact that they had that in the shooting script, they never filmed it. Or even if they did, I can't remember if they did. Uh, it was Ryan and Brad. Brad it was yeah. Brad, Brad, and Brad, Ryan. And Brad and Ryan. Yeah, mm -hmm. from the opening Trap Assault 3D. I don't think Logan was a part of this at all. No, uh, no. I'm I think like, they, yeah. I, I think they, I think they made it very clear that Logan was an apprentice around the time that he was talking about before Amanda for Hoffman, and he somehow stayed out of it. It's really unclear, and and mm -hmm. one of the things they need to do to be if they do a sequel, if they do a sequel based off this story, they need to be absolutely positively clear about what's going on. Mm -hmm. They they need to they need to give us a reason why he left. I've seen people speculate that he had his daughter. Yeah, and, and he had his daughter, and he kind of walked away. 
having learned his lesson and being able to and john helped him fix himself it is taking place before the pendulum trap in Saul five it's yeah. taking place before anything other than the flashbacks that we see in Saul two uh, or in Saul four and some of the stuff that we see in Saul two, where John, after Cecil, has put this trap together. Now we don't know how many other people were found or shown, but one of the things I love about it is we do get Billy in this trap. Now, obviously, we have Billy in the main trap uh, that was never found, so it at least indicates that. Amanda wasn't the very first Billy doll because there would need to be mm -hmm. some other Billy doll as a reference point for Hoffman to use because there was none such in, in the original films and that was something that was really obnoxious. So, uh, I But when you get back to Logan's character, I think, and I've heard a lot of people say that he got married, he had a kid, he kind of stepped away from this, and John, who was obviously testing people that had hurt him individually... Uh, or he had he knew about individually. Okay, this person, this person, you've done bad. You've hurt my. You've hurt me. I mean, hell, Logan was even a person who who kind of kind of like doomed him with the whole mistake about the X ray and trying to figure out whether mm -hmm. he had cancer before. So yeah, uh, same really thing was same same thing with Cecil. And in Saul 4, he was only testing people that he knew individually, people who had tested him, and he was testing them. And when he was saying that I helped John or John helped me, the reason I say it was a John-centric film is because we get an idea, and we have this idea at the end there where Logan was the one who was prompting John to look further, look more beyond, and try to help other people who hadn't directly affected him, to the point where we get to the Amanda scene, and even though they did retcon this further, and yes, he did know Amanda, but Amanda, at least as far as we know, he never knew that Amanda affected him, even though she did have that situation with Gideon, but it's, you know, hello Amanda, I know you, you don't know me, mm -hmm. but I'm here to help you today, and he helped me, and all this other stuff, so... I, I liked Logan's character, and I think he could bring a whole lot to the story, more so than Amanda's character did or Hoffman did when you start exploring John's philosophy. But it's convoluted. It makes very little sense why he, st he stayed out of it, and we have no idea how long he was out of it or how much he was involved with, so yeah. We don't really know that much about his character, and like, you know, I know, obviously, like if they make another film, he's going to be the main character and the one doing everything. The thing that leads me to believe that, you know, like what you said about him, you know, stepping away from the, the you know, being the Jigsaw Apprentice was right, because, you know... Uh, the, the, in this movie, like, they talk about, you know, the, the Jigsaw killings, you know, not like, like, it's clear that, you know, none, none have happened for, like, ten years, you know, for a really long time, and then this is, you know, Logan coming back, you know, to, to do it again the exact same way that it was, you know, in, in his tribe, you know, this, like, his first, you know, time, you know, doing anything Jigsaw related, you know, for a long time, but there's one, okay, there's one line at the end of this film that ruins the entire Saw timeline. Now, um, I'm not sh I'm not sure if you noticed or not, and I, I I don't think I heard you talk about it in your spoiler review, but um, like I I noticed it immediately, and I was like, what? That doesn't make any sense. And um, one of my favorite YouTubers, uh, Adam from Your Movie Sucks, did a review of this movie, and uh, he thoroughly explained uh, how this doesn't make any sense, and it was really funny. Uh, check out his review. Anyway, um, at the end of the film, the twist is being revealed. You know, in this film, and you know, in the trailers, they say that, you know, John Kramer's been dead for 10 years. But at the end of the film, Logan says, 10 years ago in this very barn, he pulls the blanket up, and he says, a game was played. And so <laughs> what, what that means is that the game, you know, supposedly sometime right after Cecil, Jigsaw's first game, or technically second game after Cecil, but first, you know, legit game, you know, before all of the flashbacks, you know, and all of the other movies, and, you know, before Saw 1, you know, all of Hoffman's origin and Amanda's origin, and, like, everything happened within around a year? Like, that doesn't make any sense. I don't know. Could you elaborate on that? Do you think maybe that was a mistake? It was, it was it was it was a mistake, but it's also it, it was a mistake, but it was also I, I I don't hark on this too much. I don't really feel like it, look. I think like saying ten years to me is easier than saying thirteen years. 
you know like i mm-hmm. i it, it flows better it goes off the tongue better uh it's it doesn't get bogged down in too much of the continuity or anything else like that so throughout the whole movie everyone says 10 years 10 years 10 years 10 years it's not true uh, the mm-hmm. the very first films take place it starts in 2004 and it ends sometime in 2007 that's where all the first seven films take place uh yeah. so yeah it I, I i would argue that this film takes place in in two in like early 2017 but i'm not sure like i i maybe there's something in there to indicate exactly what time we're on but no i i didn't take the whole 10 years ago the the game was a game was played like i just thought it was easier than saying 13 and i don't think that one line derails the entire continuity as much as people want to say i know there's a lot of people who say that this movie ruined the continuity ruined the the franchise or the the, the timeline and I, mm-hmm. I just i can't find anything and granted i've only seen it twice but i can't find anything in it that makes me feel like yeah like oh man they completely messed up one of the things this all franchise has more than on any other franchise in the horror genre is the timeline, the continuity, the characters, and everything. It makes sense in its own crazy, ridiculous way, even if people get dates wrong or something. It still makes sense if you just kind of look beyond what people might be saying at any given point. What did you think of the last sequence, the the, the final trap with the laser collars? <laughs> you know what? I have to say that I think it really kind of uh, it introduces a world in this or at least a, a logic in the Saw films that we hadn't been really accustomed to. It's mm-hmm. more of a sci-fi esque aspect of the series that they can get into in future traps. They can yeah. utilize that stuff again. I think it was kind of cool. The killing of Hollerin was one of the better things in the film, kind of gruesome yeah. in its own right. Uh, I'm I'm totally fine with it. I know a lot of people were way over way 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 annoyed with the fact that we had these laser collars when yeah. the, the first trailer came out but i liked it yeah me too i really liked it as well and the, the you know holleran's death was really awesome to or just split into seven pieces <laughs> i kind of laughed at that it was it was pretty awesome but the thing that doesn't make really doesn't really make that much sense about that is because like he was trying to frame holleran for you know because he vaguely had something to do with killing his wife because you know he let Edgar Munson free and you know he you know he killed his wife and like okay so did I wonder like if 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 Holleran let him free and then he killed his wife or he killed his wife and then let Holleran or, or, or and then let Edgar free I, I think it was I think it's the former uh it, it really doesn't make sense that he would kill Holleran like that and just leave him there because he made it very clear that Eleanor was going to be his alibi to frame Holleran. Exactly. And, he was trying to and, frame him. It doesn't make any sense why he would kill and, him. And Eleanor, well, he had to kill him, but he has to go back and clean up the body, and that wasn't... I mean, that's going to be difficult now. <laughs> like, yeah. And like uh, the, because she's because she, she, get, she catches a ride at the end of the movie. That's the last time we see her. And you know that she knows where that barn is. She's going to go tell people, exactly. we found this barn, and the people authorities are going to find it. Yeah, yeah so, uh, like, he... I, I don't understand. I really don't understand, like, what he what his end game is here, uh, for yeah. lack of a better word. Like, I, I don't know how you... I don't know how he's walking away from this logically, unless the, the sequel makes it very clear that you don't walk away from it. Because it does mm-hmm. set up the idea that Eleanor might be either a love interest later down the line or uh, maybe a potential apprentice or something else like that yeah maybe that is a possibility and um yeah yeah maybe you know um possible love interest because you know he, he he lost his wife but um yeah and I, I did like how they showed the flashback of him um you know, creating the reverse bear trap with Logan, you know, him and John. One question that I have is I don't really understand where Logan got John's voice because, you know, at the end of the film when they're showing the, you know, when the big twist happens, you saw flashbacks of Logan, you know, on on his computer and, like, you know, like he has John's voice. I, I don't really understand how he has his voice. So what he did and the way they explain it is he was using he had taken like the the catalog or whatever of John's previous work mm-hmm. and it's somehow 
because he's obviously a, com- a complete pro at audacity <laughs> uh, <laughs> had 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 segmented part of his speech like every single word and put it together flawlessly so it sounded like he was actually talking that's why when they did the voice analysis they're saying yeah this is john kramer's voice because it was his voice okay yeah i I thought maybe that that was a a plot hole going into this film i I pretty much knew they were going to do this and i was kind of unsure of if i would like it but they I did like the, how they did this. They took a lot of the saw isms and just and just kind of strayed away from it. Like, there's not a single like, all of the other saw films showed flashback from the previous film or films. Like every single one. Like, there's just such all the films were in such tight continuity with each other. And and this one, you know, like I said earlier, it's its own film, its own story. It's in the same universe, but it's kind of like like I said in my review. It's kind of like Rogue One. <laughs> Uh, which um, I really hope too many people didn't figure that out. But you know, I, I that's the latest movie review of all time. I'm pretty sure a lot of people have seen it by then. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, th- they took a lot of the saw isms, like flashbacks. Like, there's not a single frame in the film that is not shot by Peter and Michael Spearing, you know, or whoever the cinematographer was. You know what I mean? You know, mm-hmm. like, it's all, you know, from them. And, like, they, they took a lot of the... Of course, there's the epic saw twist at the end with the music. But, you know, like, you, you know, like when Logan closed the, closes the door, he doesn't say game over. Like, I was waiting for it. He just says, I speak for the dead and closes the door, which uh, I like that, how he, you know... You know, they, they weren't like, oh, you know... It wasn't like uh, other films, you know, like... You know, like Jurassic World or Finding Dory, to where like they're constantly like, "Hey, you know, r- remember this? These things you like from from uh, the the other movies in this franchise." You know what I mean? You mm-hmm. know, it, it was you know, it it remained independent, and I I liked how it remained independent. You know what I mean? One of the things I've seen for a, from a lot of people who are fans, and I I completely understand this criticism, is. The idea that what was this movie made for? Who was this movie made for? Was it made for people who were supposed to find Jigsaw and not have really much of a connection with the other films and just kind of go into it fresh and have fun? Or was it made for the fans? Because if it was made for the fans, they didn't put a lot into it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they obviously, it's a film. They spent $10 million on it. They put a whole lot into it, and I, I appreciate everything that they did. But they didn't do enough telling us or showing us all the stuff that we came to love about the franchise there was no hoffman no dr gordon no not a whole lot of john absolutely no amanda uh just a vague reference to jill tuck and all this other stuff and one and one of the things us fans really like is the idea that yeah these films are based around each other they they rely on each other to explain and 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 develop the story so so back in the day, and I felt like this is one of the special things about the franchise, I, I don't have to like Saw 5. I don't have to like Saw 4. But so, seeing Saw 6 gives an idea, an, a, a really great idea and helps explain and, and make the, those other better, those other ones better. Saw has always been a binge-watchable movie series because it not... Any single one of them relies on its own, but you can watch any of them individually, uh, especially the first three. But yeah, uh, no, they they didn't. They got rid of they got rid of all that stuff. They tried to do their own complete story away from that stuff. And what I think that does is it causes a lot of confusion among fans, among among movie reviewers, among people who just want to sit there and watch because they might have some idea of what's going on and how things played out but when you sit there and be like 10 years ago a a game was played and you're like wait Mm -hmm. how does that make sense this breaks the timeline because they're not doing enough if the words just aren't right and you can't look past it they're not doing enough to explain just where things are taking place or how they were taking place or how long and it really hurts things let's get into the characters a little bit because um I've heard a lot of people say that, like, the, the characters were, you know, pretty weak. I, I really like the characters in this. What do you think about the characters? The very first time I saw it, the only one who stood out to me, only one, and I, and I have to be completely honest, Hannah Emily Anderson is the only one who really stood out to me mm-hmm. uh, the very first time I watched it. Her character was somewhere along the lines, really treading the lines in between some of the more fanatic Jigsaw people that we'd seen throughout the other the other entries of the series. And and just being 
unique enough. You know, we get an, an idea of who she is, her character, and what she does on her free time more than we get anyone else in this this whole movie. Uh, the whole Jigsaw Rules aspect of her, why she's working with um, Matt Passmore's Logan character, mm -hmm. and everything else like that. It's just, there's a lot of mystery to her, there's a lot of intrigue, and one of the people leaving this film, I thought, I want to see more of that person. I want to see more of 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 what she has to offer the franchise, and I really hope if they do do a sequel, that's what they focus on. But when it comes to everyone else in the movie, I would have to say the only other person that really grabbed my interest, and I don't remember the actor's name off the top of my head, but the guy who plays Ryan, he really kind of killed it in his in his portrayal of the character. And one of those unique Saul victim characters who who has an an just a defined personality about him. And it was one of those things where from the moment you see him, you don't think he's going to last as long as he does, but the mere fact that he is kind of the last man standing, even though he did lose or was part of the losing mm -hmm. aspect of the barn game, was probably one of the best things about the film, in my opinion. The scene with Tobin Bell. Now, I did... You know, Tobin Bell is my favorite movie villain ever. The thing about this movie is that, like, he's not in the movie very much, but yet, you know, like, the film is, like about him you know like as you said you know in your review the the movie's like more john centric you know the most john centric saw film we've seen since saw four but like he's he's not in the film that much you know mm -hmm. but you know I, I really liked how they used him in the movie because you know like when he first you know initially took his hood off in that scene which oh, i love that scene by the way like I, you know, did you actually think that he's been still alive this whole time, or or did you like, or or like, what what exactly was going through your mind in that scene? Were you thinking like, oh my god, yes, John's still alive, or what? <laughs> uh, you know, you know, the thing is, when it comes to the Saw franchise, you get eight films into a horror movie franchise, and of course, this goes without saying. You've seen we've seen this happen before. We've seen, and I've I've actually been rewatching, you know, things like the Halloween franchise. The Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Friday the 13th. Eventually, all of those franchises got into strange motifs. Like, they got into these strange story elements that they had to use to justify how they keep bringing back the people that they killed uh, yeah. movies and movies and movies ago, or every single movie. And with Jason, you kind of make him a zombified monster figure. Obviously, Freddy is a dream a uh, dream nightmare creature who goes around and, and kills young people. But then you also have Michael Myers, who they got in this whole druid cult thing. And Hellraiser did the same thing. They figured out a way to bring him back after the second film. Chucky obviously has reasons to come back. But with, <laughs> yeah. with the Saw franchise, I, I just couldn't see them doing it. I couldn't see them coming up with a reason to bring him back and say, oh, yeah, he had faked his death. Or something else like that. So when they finally did show him, at least myself in the audience, and granted I am one of the people who has rewatched all of these films more times than I can even count or remember, I knew they weren't going that way. I felt like this this franchise has a lot more integrity than that. But the problem with yeah. it is, and, and I have to admit, I like that scene, but the problem with that scene is once he shows up, once he is on screen, which we knew he, it was coming, you get into a, a little bit of a, okay, it has to be taking place in the, in, in, a, in the past. And the way he's, the way he's uh, especially if you're a big fan, you realize that the way he looks, you know, with his bald face and his little love, love patch, you know, with the, with the uh, mustache, you yeah, know, the, okay, this the, is... The goatee, like the same the go one he yeah. had in the original Saw, yeah. Yeah, so you know that this is taking place sometime around the original Saw, sometime around after he, uh, right before Amanda or right around the original Saul timeline, and that's where it's taking place. You also get to see that look that he has in Saul 5. Gotta hand it to them. Continuity is still impeccable with this. Like, they didn't have to make him look like that, but they did, and it really lines up with Saul 5 and Saul 1 and all these other Sauls that we've seen where he looks like that in particular. So I have to admit that. But no, I didn't think he was back. I didn't think he was alive again, and I knew the, the twist basically ever since uh, Eleanor's character was talking about the blender trap being something that no one ever found before. That was one of the big things that, one of the, okay, that's how it's going to play out. I see what you're saying. Yeah, you, you got you got the twist ruined for you. You see, like I, 
I actually didn't, and, you know, I was watching the whole thing, like, you know, thinking that everything was happening now, you know, in, in the present day. And, like, when, you know, when he took that hood off, I, I was thinking, okay, they got some explaining to do. And then, like, <laughs> <laughs> I, and, uh, you know, I I was just thinking that, like, the reason why I didn't think, oh, it's it's got to be taking place in the past was because, like, you know, you would think that, like, they would have, because, like, John Kramer looks the oldest he's ever been, but this is supposedly taking place before all of the other films. So, like, you know, that's one of the reasons why... If they would have did a... If they would have tried to make him look, like, a little bit younger, like, it would get rid of some of his wrinkles and stuff, then I would have maybe thought, like, oh, maybe this is taking place in the past. But, yeah, I know his goatee, but... I don't know. I don't know. For some reason, I didn't think of it that way, but... That's... You know, like, you have to... You have to give him credit, but you also have to realize that... They are they are playing with a loaded deck right now. They do not have much options unless they do do something where he faked his death or something else like that, mm-hmm. making him. You have to play with the flashbacks. And honestly, if I can be clear, I knew what they were doing. I'm fine as a fan with what they're doing, but a lot of people listening to this probably aren't. And I want to make it clear that I feel I understand where they're coming from. Uh you can only play around with the flashback motif so much and once you do you start doing what this film did and you can't really beat around the bush with it they really did take other twists from the series and replay them Mm -hmm. uh we've seen this stuff before we've seen playing around with the timeline where the trap's taking place in saw 2 we've seen we've seen a kind of infringing on the trap that's taking place or not being the right trap the, the location that you're supposed to be playing around with the, the, everything that happens in this film we've seen in Saul 2 or maybe in Saul 5 if you want to you want to play that up after the blood trap so uh, yeah you know i i understand that but i really feel like a a reintroduction to the series that has some of the more I guess memorable or or defined iconography, the pig mask, Billy the puppet, all this other mm-hmm. stuff that we've seen in this film, without hinging itself on old characters that you would really have to go back to films that are over a decade old now to figure out what the heck is going on. I think they did a com- like a commendable job. They made this movie so you know. You know, new generations coming to the film, you know, like, didn't have to watch all the other movies. Because, like, you know, all of the other films, you know, were pretty much, you know, requiring the homework of the previous films. Like, like you need to watch every single movie. But this one, like, you know, uh, is, is you know, like, stand on, it stands on its own, you know. It, it, it's, it's its own, you know, standalone film. You know, like, that's why it's not called Saw 8, it's called Jigsaw, which... You know, like like I said earlier, like this film is more John centric than like the past few, and you know, that's, that's that's another reason why it's called Jigsaw because of that too. But anyway, we see John use the Billy the Puppet doll in this film, but like in, in Saw in the flashback in Saw Three with Amanda, we see him making it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. He had two Saw dolls. I don't know. I mean, he had so many Saw dolls. I mean. In Saw Seven, there's just there like Billy puppets are just hanging out in Hoffman's yeah. Hoffman's little uh, getaway area that he blows up at the end. Uh, he, he we see him making it in Saw Three. He he just has a lot of them, I think. I mean, one of them blows up in uh in Perez's face oh, in Saw yeah. Four. So uh, okay, yeah, so okay. he has a lot. Never mind. <laughs> and, and, and plus the one I didn't really think about that because I mean I just. Like, the reason why I brought that up is because, you know, like, for so many years of watching Saw 3, I always thought that that was the first one because, you know, it was the, you know, the one that, um, you know, from the original film that, you know, uh, James and Lee Wanell made. And I, I just always, or excuse me, just James Wan made. And I, I always thought, you know, I, I always had it in my head that that was the first one. but And, like, the, the one in this one looks a little newer, you know, with, with the eyes, but w- whatever. And plus, you know... Another small thing nitpick, you know, like, because, I don't know, like, the reason why I got into that big, you know, argument earlier was because, you know, like, in films, you know, cont- continuity issues really are, are kind of a pet peeve of mine with films, but, you know, like, they, they don't, they rarely, you know, ever completely ruin the experience of a film. Anyway, like, in, in the game, in the uh, uh, grain silo, you know, he has an HD TV, you know, <laughs> but, but this is supposedly taking place before... You know any of the other films, 
you know, and like they were, they were, you know, in the other films they were using like you know flip phones and like Gordon was using a pager and stuff like that. But whatever, you know, like small stuff like that, all you know, let go. But at the same time, I, it's like whatever. I was I was laughing about that after the second time I'd seen it because uh-huh. you know it's not something you think about at the very beginning, but you're like. When you think about it, like they did have those flat screen tele, not like that, but they did have flat screen televisions in two thousand and three, which I imagine is where this is taking place. And uh, I just kind of laughed because even though they have portrayed John to be a fabulously wealthy individual, I just imagine you know there are certain things that just kind of break the bank. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) a a flat screen TV like that in two thousand three would have been really expensive, and it wouldn't have really lasted for much of really of a purpose. Yeah. So that's why he kind of that's why he decides to kind of spin less and go to like the tube screens that we see at the very beginning of the first film and all those other things. What did you think of the uh, the musical score at at the end of the film? Because it sort of combines like a lot of the scores of of all the films. You know, at the end we get a little Hello Zap, and then you know at the beginning and throughout a lot of it, it's 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 pretty much the the Zep Six score. I think it's called. You know, at, at the end of Saw Six, but you know it's. Um, it sounds, you know, like they didn't really do too many changes to it. I mean, it does sound different, but it's pretty much the same music. Like, what did you think of the score? The score's a the score's fine. Uh, mm-hmm. I feel I'm really glad that they got Charlie Clouser back. Yes, um, same. I I am glad, but you know, just if you you want my real honest opinion, I think that if they were going to do another one, I kind of want them to get someone else. Um, mm-hmm. He's worked on eight films now. I appreciate it. I think everything, uh, his score is what made Saul what it is. But I would really like someone else to go in here and try to figure out Something a different. new, yeah. a new uh, score, a new sound. You know, for that that contrasts, but also uh, is familiar. I know that's like a, that's so vague. It's it's almost an, it's almost an impossible standard. But it's something I would like to see. I will say. I think one of the things they need to do is they need to scale back the movie. They need to scale back the franchise. They need to spend a lot less money, and you need to go back to basically your roots. Yeah. Uh, so I and I I'm completely okay with them doing the way they did it right now. It's kind of memorable. It's it's different enough, but it has somewhat of the same formula that people would be like, yeah, this is a Saw film. I remember seeing these as kids or as a kid or when I was younger. So it's instantly recognizable. I think you need to go a little bit further back, though, and you need to focus more so on the plot structure and formula that worked so well in the first or second film. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah uh, right. Spend money, spend less money, and figure out issues that you like. Figure out things that you want to explore more. Uh, personally, personally, I would really want to explore more of Eleanor's character. As I said, I want to explore yeah. Jigsaw rules. Because I think that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, there's someone there who's giving and has all of these outlines or, or blueprints to traps that were either made or not made that they either know about or not know about. One of the big things to me that I thought was really interesting was when we go to Eleanor's little uh, studio, <laughs> for yeah. lack of a better word, uh, yeah. she has the keyhole keyhole trap from Saw from Two, Saw, some which, Saw Two, which which means they found the Saw Two house. Which well. It doesn't mean they found the Saw 2 house because it doesn't have to mean that because she said she's building all of these traps based on blueprints that she's gotten from Jigsaw Rules. Yeah, that's what and, I was about to say. Okay, all right, yeah. And and <laughs> and they had seen this trap. Just because they haven't found the Jigsaw 2 house, they did see it because it was recorded and played and they found the recording tapes in the extra nerve gas house in Saw 2. So even if they don't find that house or they don't know where it is, because we do know in Saw 5 that Strom goes into it and it's been kind of covered up and redecorated and everything else like that, mm-hmm. it's possible that it's still out there. And I want to see more of that. I want to see more of all of how this all plays into the greater narrative. I want to learn more about how or why Eleanor decided to work with Logan in the first place and why it's so quote unquote complicated that she stay here uh, when there's really no reason to. That's the stuff I would really like for them to explore. This film was also edited by Kevin Gruder, I think that's how you pronounce his name, who directed Saw 6 and 7 and edited... Did he edit all of the films or just the... I, I don't think he edited the last two that he directed. Gruder. One of the things I've liked and come to really appreciate, especially in the first three films, were just how fast they moved. Mm-hmm. And I really feel like 
like I've been saying all along, this one really was a a a, a, a drawing back, as you said earlier. You know, you kind of, kind of take the iconography of Saul. You take the the Saul isms, as it were, to uh, kind of display where we are, but get so far away from them or not focus on them enough to give people some grounding. One of the things I would have liked to see in this film, just me personally, is because they dealt with the same type of twist that Saul 2 had, because they dealt with the same type of uh, f- story structure as the the second or as the fourth one, uh-huh. it's... It, it would have been nice to see something that was more akin to that, like editing wise. It should have been fast, fast, fast. Uh, there's points in this movie where it's slow, more like probably the most in the the end and the end montage. I mean, contrast the yeah. end montage of the twist and everything to Saul three or Saul one or Saul is like just slow it's it's droggy it's like okay we're here we're here we're going through this but in Saul 3 and Saul 2 it was just like bam 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 like uh-huh. uh and, and there's something about that that just wakes you up in the theater it wakes you up as an audience member and it makes you think on your feet about how everything falls into place I think that's gonna be it for this uh review I don't know how long this is gonna end up being but I think I said pretty much everything that I wanted to say. It was a really good movie, I thought. It, it definitely could have been get better. I gave it a B plus in my review. Where would you rank it among the other soft films? Hard question. Um, I would definitely put it in probably the fourth or fifth best. I haven't decided yet. And if I were to say uh, where I rank all these films, I think a lot of people would be really shocked as to where I put some of them. Some of them easy to say where they fall this one i really would say it's somewhere in the middle i'm just not sure yet yeah exactly somewhere in the middle it's really in general hard to rank these films because i I think i like saw two and four about the same i love you know like a lot of the films i love it about uh, the the same except you know i think saw three one and six are my three favorites definitely it's it's one three then six uh, i think but then you know the rest of them you know besides seven you know like two four and five you know i think i like about the same this is the eighth film in a long-running horror franchise i feel like you know they definitely without a doubt had to do something completely different to keep this film you know to keep the series fresh because if they did the same thing you know everyone would be like oh another one of these things i think they did a pretty good job with this one you know like when i first initially left the theater from jigsaw i was kind of i mean i i knew i liked it but i i was just there's a lot that happened in this movie you know and, and i was thinking oh i don't know if this adds up i don't know if this adds up the 10 years thing uh i've come to say definitively say that this is a good really good entry in the series it's not a saw one not a saw three uh, not a saw six i completely agree with you and i do want to just kind of emphasize this point I feel like it's only fair. It is, I believe it's only fair to look at Jigsaw through the lens of other horror sequels that have been so fortunate enough to get to eight films. Yeah, this is one thing so, you brought up in your review. So look look up Jigsaw, uh, but you have to compare it. I, I believe, I mean, obvi- obviously you can uh, disagree with me in the comment section below all you want. But look at Jigsaw in comparison to Jason Takes Manhattan. <laughs> look at in comparison to uh, to Jason Freddy vs. Jason, which was the eighth film in the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street series, mm-hmm. uh, right after New Nightmare, which a lot of people like. I don't like. Uh, and then also, what was it? Hell World, the the internet version and everything of the. Uh, or I can't remember if it was Hell World or one of the other Hellraiser mm-hmm. movies that got was the eighth one. Also, uh, uh, Halloween uh, Retribution? It was Resurrection. It Resurrection, was, oh, it's yeah. It's so bad. Like, it's so bad, you know, with Buster Rhymes, with Buster Rhymes versus Michael Myers. Trick or treat, motherfucker. Like, that, that's the type of stuff. Like, look at Jigsaw in that, like, in that scope of movies or the, the landscape of other horror franchises mm-hmm. who have been so fortunate to make it this far. Mm-hmm. And then tell me whether you think it's a bad film. Yeah, and, and and honestly, I I can't think I can't think of any other long running horror franchises that have gotten to eight films that are as good as this one. Exactly. That's still in theaters. That's that's still a commanding screen presence. I I really can't think of it. I always thought that you know, 
I didn't really want this to continue any further. Like, I always thought, like, okay, they need to make one more movie to explain all the plot holes and everything. But, like, this one, you know, it was its own, it's, its own story, but it really just adds more building blocks to it. I completely agree, and it's, it's not the best. It's not perfect, but it is pretty good for what we got and how long it took them to make this film and everything else like that. I, I'm, I'm hoping for... I'm hoping for a drop the mic sequel if they ever do one that's that's what i'm really hoping for um anything else you want to say about the film mark no i think i've gotten everything off my chest thanks so much for having me man oh you're welcome man that's gonna be it for the spoiler review thank you so much for those of you who actually listened to this entire review thank you so much for watching i really appreciate it down below in the comments let me know what you guys thought of uh this review and let me know what you guys thought of the film jigsaw and you know like if you are a saw fan which like you know if you're not a saw fan i assume you know you didn't listen to this whole thing and uh let me know what you guys thought of mark and uh, definitely go subscribe to him. His the link to both of his channels, Real to Real Productions and Real Talk, will be down in the description below. Like I said, really uh, awesome dude. Really well thought out analytical reviews, and a very soothing voice. Follow me on Instagram and add me on Snapchat. Those links will be down and down in the description below, as well as follow me on Twitter at Labonimus and follow Mark at Real to Real Productions. Is that what your Twitter is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it. So uh, I'll see you guys later. Say bye, Mark. Bye, Mark. <laughs>